Hello and welcome to Showband Heroes, where we get to meet the men and women who created the most successful live music era in Irish history, and who entertained us throughout the 60s and 70s and kept us dancing with each other, even during our darker days. My guest today is Jean Chetty. I better get used to calling you Jean now. <laughs> anyway, you're very, very welcome uh, to Showband Heroes, Jean. Um, I can uh, remember the excitement in in uh, our hometown of Carrigan-Shore when Jean and the gents would uh, would come, or even when we saw you on the coming soon list. Uh, how did it all start for you? Um, I was actually a student in Dublin. I arrived in Dublin, I think it was October 1962, and always very interested in music. And uh, I spoke to a few student friends, and they told me about the show bands. And they said, this, you will like this. There was a great band playing in Dublin called the Miami. And would you believe that was the very first show band I heard? And I must admit, Stephen, when, when I went there, most people were dancing. I just stood open mouth, thought, I've never heard anything like this, you know, with the brass, et cetera, and a brilliant lead singer in Dickey. And after that, I think uh, my studies took second place. All I thought was, I'd love to be in a show band, even though that wasn't the reason I came to Dublin. And to sum up, um, I saw an advert, early 64 by now, and, and in the meanwhile, I'd heard a lot of bands. I even got to know the lads in the Miami, Murty, Dickey, etc., and said I was dying to join a show band. And Murty said, well, look at the Irish Independent, you'll see an ad, or see ads. And a band, at that stage, it didn't have a name or didn't name themselves, advertised for a lead singer. I saw the advert in the Independent and applied. And Henry, Paddy McDermott, the lead and sax player, together with the manager, came down to interview me and, and the bass player. And in the flat where I was staying, uh, they had a little amp and a guitar and said, do, do a few numbers. And... Uh, I looked at Henry and much later realized why he looked at me strangely when I said, do you know Chuck Berry's Sweet Little Sixteen? <laughs> well, he was very adept at playing that. So that was one of the songs I sang, and then Blue, Blueberry Hill. Uh, and fortunately, they then said, well, we'd like you to join the band as a lead singer. I should emphasize, I'd never sung with a band before. I just uh, sung in talent contests in South Africa. And so for me, this was stepping in well, I wouldn't say the unknown because I'd heard show bands. Uh, four of them had broken away from the Skyrockets, and uh, that's how we started Gene and the Gems. Initially, I think the band was called the Giants, but there was already a band with that name. Uh, my name is Dushy, and they said it didn't rhyme with what they had planned. They were going to call the band the Gems. So hence Gene and the Gems. Did you just start, start rehearsing, or did you just jump yes, in there? Uh, Three days before, because I joined pr pretty late in the day, uh, three days before our debut, I think it was in Monaghan in uh, St. Patrick's Day. So initially, I think I only had a list of about eight or ten numbers, a few Chuck Berry songs, a few Beatles songs. And that night, as you know, in the early days, before you had a relief band, you're probably doing three or four hours. So I must have sung my set about three times that night. <laughs> and then over the next couple of weeks, started learning uh, the top 20 hits. And then that grew. And where were you based? Where was the band based? Uh, the band was based in Enniskillen. So initially I had to find myself digs. And uh, eventually I was very lucky. Uh, I found a wonderful landlady and... Uh, lived with her and her husband uh, un until I got married a couple of years later. And did you just quit your studies instantly? Yeah, yes, I did. And um, that didn't go down very well because I was on a sponsorship for studying. And once they realized I wasn't going to study, it was a family grant. The money obviously stopped. And by now I was earning as a show band uh, performer, so it, it, it wasn't a problem. My parents weren't too happy, obviously. Uh, but once we established ourselves, my dad actually came over, I think, 
in 66. He, he saw the band performing, how we were doing, but did say to me, this is not going to be a long-term career for you. How long did it last? Yeah, it lasted uh, about six years. And um, my father-in-law, who was an industrialist, kept saying to me, I, I think it's time you went back to your studies. So it was, it was short and sweet. I started at the age of 20, and by the age of 26, I was in full-time employment and studying again in the evening. Um, what were you studying? Uh, um, uh, bu business studies I went for. Uh, I got a job with a local company in Swansea in South Wales, and they sponsored me through evening studies where I did my postgrad in uh, management studies. Uh, at the time I left, after six years, uh, this coincided with all the troubles in the North, and Gina Vivienne, I think 75% of our work was in the North. And I was getting a bit nervous then, you know, with the troubles. It was something new to me. When we played in Belfast, you were driving through, you know, military posts and seeing soldiers with rifles. That made me very uncomfortable. I'm fascinated at, at the idea that, that with no experience other than, say, singing at a few talent contests, that you actually joined the band uh, without any experience. Did you play an instrument? No, I didn't play an instrument at all. Uh, fortunately for me, they were all experienced performers with six to ten years of show band experience. And I think their experience and encouragement, I learned a lot from them about stagecraft. And I, I knew I had a confident bunch behind me. And I think that gave me the confidence to improve as time went along and develop my own style. So you, you took your lead from the show bands that you had seen watching the likes of Morty and the Miami and the Royal and all of those bands. Yes, most definitely. But you also developed your own style, didn't you? I mean, there was a, a first of all, um, uh, I remember when Gene and the gents would, were due to come to, to our, our hometown, as I said earlier on. Um, there was two reasons that, that the place was packed. First of all, all, all the girls went to see you, and, uh, and uh, <laughs> there was a bunch of musicians down down there that wanted to see Henry. That's very um, true. Uh, and uh, I remember uh, thinking that it, you, your band, the Gents, were probably one of the more one of the most friendly bands that we had ever come across because. Uh, Henry always had time, as had the bass player and the others had time for the young for young guys. And we would ask to, you know, to show us the latest, as you mentioned earlier on, uh, Chuck Berry songs or the lick, the licks from the songs, the, 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 the Chuck Berry famous riffs and all of that. And the band always took took time to sit on the stage once the gear was set up and and uh, and and show us the, the latest riff. Yes, Henry, Henry right till, till his last days. Well, always encourage other musicians, yeah. That was very much part of his character. Did you do all the singing? Or I mean, Henry was a singer as well, wasn't he? Yes, um, Henry sang. Uh, our bass player, Barry Scully, sang. Uh, and the late Barry Scully, uh, another very good singer. So, no, I, I, I didn't do all of the singing. Whilst I did most of it, uh, we were lucky. I think there was at least uh, Dermot sang, Tony sang. So, so we had four or five other guys singing, which was good. Uh, it gave us variety and uh, versatility. You were a novelty, weren't you? In, uh, in, <laughs> in, in, uh, on, on the show band scene, there was, well, everybody that we ever saw on the show bands up until then was probably Irish. Yes, I, I, I think, uh, I'm, I'm sure there might have been a guy with a band called the Jordanaires, L. Jordan, just before me. I think I was then the second person of colour. I think Rowley Daniels came a, bit, a few months later. And... When we played in rural Ireland, I'm sure they hadn't seen anyone of colour, maybe the odd Indian doctor at the local hospital. So uh, initially, uh, but the, the thing I would say, uh, I found the Irish people or the dancers very respectful and very friendly. But it was fascinating at the end of dances. Uh, some girls would come up to me and say, would you mind if I hold your hand? What, why is the palm of your hand a different colour? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was exotic, wasn't it? I mean, you had a massive yes. female following at that time. Yes. You, you mentioned Earl Jordan. I remember Earl. Um, he was he was a great singer. I think he went on to Very Germany. Good, 
he was uh, joined some of the big orchestras out there. I think the philosophers may also have had uh, oh, yeah. had, had someone. Um, and then later on, of course, Ronnie Medford and Laurie Hart and people like that. So it became yeah. you were no longer the most exotic singer in the country. But yeah. how did how did the style that you had grown up with? Uh, how did you adapt to the uh, the style of music that was uh, that was required for a show band? Because that encompassed nearly everything, didn't it? Yeah. Um, well, I always liked rock and roll songs, uh, and I like uh, a nice ballad. So my taste in music really did fit in with the show bands. And then I had to adapt to Beatles type of songs. And then very much, uh, we were always trying to play the latest hits. And the band leader would listen to a song and say, I think that suits your voice or Henry's voice or the bass player's voice. And very, very quickly we, we adapted to it. And, and I think also we learned, uh, we played a lot in the cities and if we played in Belfast, uh, we'd have a very pop type of program and, and rock and roll. And if we played in the country areas, it was, uh, we, we played similar songs, but also added a bit more country music than we did in the city places. Uh, the North was always very, it was very progressive because as we always say, it had uh, the BBC, which had top of the pops uh, every, every week. So you had, to, you had to keep up with the latest pops, didn't you? Most definitely, we, we did. And we were also in a good situation in our early days. I think we must have appeared with 10 or 12 other British groups at different times, uh, including, I think, uh, groups like The Move, uh, The Tremolos, Herman's Helmets, uh, The Love Affair, etc. Where would you have appeared with them? I think The Move, it was somewhere in De Derry, um, Herman's Helmets, I think it was the Ulster Hall, that, that was more a concert. But in the main, uh, the Tremolos, I think it was Omar, the Royal Arms. So in the main, we, we were playing with them at dances. Uh, the Tremolos did a, a, a lot of touring in Ireland, didn't they? they yes, they, they did. They, they even did uh, some Irish music on their, um, I mean, traditional Irish music on, on, on guitar, right? I, I remember. But Henry was... Henry uh, was, and I'd say Henry McCullough and um, Barney Skillen were way ahead of their time. They were rocking up some of the Irish tunes, weren't they? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, I remember when we performed with The Move and just before they took to the stage, uh, literally I was performing the last number and sort of turned towards the, uh, looking in their direction and Henry was playing a guitar solo. Uh, without exaggeration, they were virtually standing there open mouth, probably thinking to themselves, whoa, Little Old Ireland has a tremendous guitarist. They thought all the good musicians were in England. Well, obviously, Henry went on to to uh, to be with uh, Joe Cocker in, in, in Woodstock uh, on that iconic uh, Little Help from My Friends. That's Henry there playing it uh, and singing harmony. And, of course, he went on then to... Uh, to join Paul McCartney's wings. Absolutely. That, that was incredible. Yeah. The and quality, the, the quality that you had in the gents, I mean, Barry Scully as a bass player, people like that uh, uh, probably made life easy for you, did it? Having that type of support. Oh, uh, tremendous. Um, because ba Barry uh, had also performed in Germany with different groups. And I don't know if you remember Emil Fort and the Checkmates. Oh, oh yes. And uh, after the, his original band uh, broke up, he often toured Ireland. And Barry was part of his backing band, uh, and they performed in Germany as well. So I learned a lot. Uh, I had a lot of tips from Barry in terms of stagecraft, etc., because he was just so experienced. And in rock and roll numbers. It wasn't difficult to sing when you have the two of them and the driving beat behind you. It was a great, I mean, as you say, your, your stint in the show bands only lasted about six years, but it was uh, such a, an amazing uh, six years to have played with people like that. And for them to, uh, it was a big adventure for all of you, wasn't it? Oh, it, it was tremendous. And even today, when I look back on my career, even though I changed careers, uh, I can only uh, actually say those six years, 
And then the latter 10 years of my life when I went into lecturing were the most enjoyable times. That's, that's um, exactly what Henry said. I was producing them uh, just a couple of years before he died. I was in the studio uh, as a producer with, with Henry. And I asked him what his uh, favourite time was, if he could relive any time during his, uh, his life. And he said the show bands. Uh, and he mentioned, obviously, the Skyrockets, as you said earlier on, and, 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 and Gene the Gents. And, you know, despite all of the, the fantastic uh, achievements that he had, that to say that had he an opportunity to relive any time, it would have been with the show bands, just shows how special a time it was for everybody. Yeah. It, it was an incredible experience, and even some of those in English groups we performed with. I remember when we performed with The Love Affair, and um, during the break, talking to Steve Ellis, their lead singer, uh, he looked at our set and he was quite pleased we, we were performing Everlasting Love. And uh, he just couldn't understand how we could play five nights a week, <laughs> be on stage for at least three hours, and he said they, they they just couldn't do that, you know, because they had the uh, added advantage when they performed in the studio of session musicians. And they actually, he was a brilliant singer, but they struggled when they performed live because they just had a few guitars and uh, keyboards and drums. I think as far as I remember, uh, Blue Mink, the guys from Blue Mink, Blue Mink would have been the session players. I think Herbie Flores perhaps played the the bass on that fabulous big hit they had, Everlasting Love. You didn't do Everlasting Love when you were playing with the the uh, the love affair, did you? Well, we, we were not. We, we, we did that night. Um, uh, sa- sa- sadly, they uh, finished their set and because the sound was so poor, uh, Steve Ellis' voice was fine, uh, they got a very poor reception from the crowd. And our band lead uh, uh, was very good at sussing out crowds, and I think a bit naughty. <laughs> and when we went back on stage, because the crowd were cheering for us, he said, right, we're going to start with Everlasting Love. Uh, and to be fair, uh, later, after the gig, Steve Ellis said, well, you guys had the advantage of having the brass, which we didn't have. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a sensational, sensational record. Oh, absolutely. And can you remember some of the venues you played in, in the North in particular? Um, yeah, the Orpheus in Belfast, uh, Romano's in, in, in Belfast. I think in our early days we played, I'm not sure what it's called, uh, the Astor, I think, uh, Astor Ballroom in, in, in Belfast as well. Yeah, th- those are the three. And then in Bangor we played in... Uh, Capronis, you would have played Capronis. Capronis, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 of course, you played in the South as well, didn't you? Uh, yeah, we did. Um, we played the Iron a few times. We didn't, uh, um, I think we didn't do the South enough, you know, to really establish ourselves or be as big as we were in the North. But we played the Iron, uh, Crystal Ballroom. Uh, we played at one of the Axe gigs, I think, uh, and the Top Hat down there. Uh, and that was later on then, because the top hat didn't open until late. Um, yes, I think probably about 68, 60, yeah, 68, I think. It was a very, very big, big venue. Uh, but uh, as I say, you played, you played down South Tipperary, you played all over, uh, you played Watford, all of those venues as well. Yes, we did, yeah. And being based in Enniskillen, did you stay over? Did you, did you link uh, your dates? Yeah, sometimes we did. We we tried to uh, amalgamate, uh, you know, if we were going to play near Cork and try and get another venue near there. But there were times if we played in Dublin one night, uh, we'd, we'd return, uh, return home the same night, and the next day venture further north on uh, another 100-mile journey. Uh, if I think about it now, I'm just tired thinking of the travelling. Who managed you? Uh, in uh, the- initially... When the band started, we had a manager, uh, the late Fergus Sherlock, who started uh, actually, he used to be a singer in the Gallaglass Cayley band. I think they, they had a residential stint at Laurel, Laurel Park on the outskirts of Dublin. Uh, so Fergus managed us, uh, managed us for the first two years. 
but he he then felt uh, he couldn't take the band f- further because we needed bigger management and on reflection i think we made the wrong choice because uh, there were two northern promoters keen in taking over the band one was sam smith who was managing ballrooms and the other was jim aiken but i think jim aiken had a bigger promotion sam had a lot on his plate and didn't devote as much time as he could to the band i think it's a, a hindsight as they say is 2020 vision so absolutely uh, but at, at the end of the day, I th- as you say, when the when the so-called troubles began to happen, regardless of how much success you were having, you would have left, would you? Uh, m- most certainly. Uh, be- bearing in mind, uh, I, I was born in South Africa and lived my first 18, uh, 19 years of my life through the apartheid years. And I've seen riots and problems, etc. Didn't want to go through that again. Did you come directly from South Africa to Dublin to, for your study? Yeah, yes, I did, yeah. It was for the first time I'd left the country. Well, that, that must have been a, a, a big, big uh, change. Um, it was quite a shock to the system. And uh, for quite a few years, the South African, or for the first two years in Dublin, certainly during my student days, the South African apartheid system was still ingrained in me. Uh, till an Irish pal told me, a fellow student, he said, when, whenever we go on the bus, why do you make a beeline for, to sit upstairs right at the back, even if the bus is empty? Oh, I said, I wasn't aware I was doing that. He said, yes, you do that every time. And I suddenly realized the subconsciousness of the apartheid system was still ingrained in me. And I mean, strange question perhaps to ask you in this context, but is there a residue for people of your generation? I mean, do things like that still come back to this, still affect you? Um, no, I'd say not, because I've lived away from South Africa for so long. And since then, I've gone back on the holidays a few times. Uh, I've gone with my wife, my son, uh, with my son. And, of course, it's now post-apartheid, and I've seen the changes there. Uh, and it's quite fascinating talking to my nephew and niece who were born post-apartheid and they didn't realise the experiences we had. Perhaps there's a, a, an echo there for um, the post-conflict in the North, that there's a, there, there's a generation there that didn't have the same experience that the intimidating uh, experience that you had or that you felt and, or, or that I had. Um, do you think there's a parallel there somewhere? Um, yes, I, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, with musicians, as you know, you know, in, in the band, we had different religions. To us, all we were interested in music. Uh, uh, we, we, re- we rarely talked religion. All of the boys in the band were interested in my South African experience. And with the younger dancers, uh, when we spoke to them, they never ever said to any of us, never spoke religion. Uh, there was one strange experience in the early days of Gene and the Gems. Uh, we played in what was classified as an orange hall. And I don't know what happened, but usually the band leader gave us a cue at the end of the gig uh, that you'd play the national anthem. And would you believe, for some reason, we started playing the soldier song? And after a few bars, the manager ran onto the stage, all sorts of expletives. What are you guys doing? You play God Save the Queen. And later, the the band leader uh, apologized profusely. It was a genuine mistake. And the manager said, if you guys weren't so popular in this hall, you would have been lynched. So that's, you know, (laughs) that was quite an experience. It's a, it's, it's, it's very sad when when uh, politics uh, or sectarianism of any sort uh, clashes with with uh, entertainment. And but the great thing was that it was very rare, wasn't it? I mean, there was no sectarianism in the band business, was there? Especially in the show band, but there was nothing no. like that. No, none at all. Absolutely none at all. So when you went into a, a ballroom. 
uh, sectarianism was left outside the door. Yes, yeah. I, I would agree very much so. As I said, uh, if I was introduced to a dancer uh, or talking to people at the end of the dance, I wouldn't know what religion they were and you know, it wouldn't bother me. Uh, having said that, uh, through my father-in-law, who was in a fairly, fairly senior position, uh, he did tell me that with employment at that stage, uh, there was sectar sectarianism and favoritism uh, in the employment market. Was there a difference in, uh, in the response to you being on stage uh, north uh, as opposed to south or vice versa? Uh, I think because we played so, so, so much in the north, um, we, we used to get uh, a tremendous response. But then in the south, uh, especially in the early days, because our manager was from Navin, uh, we did a lot of work around the, uh, the county meat area and we got just as good a response there as we used to get in the north. So it was the, the music that was doing the talking. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely in the music. Yeah. So uh, we often talk about uh, about the, you know the heroism of the that's why we call the the the, the series show band heroes, and uh, the show bands uh, men and women that were with the show bands were to me they were all heroes because they brought people together even though we didn't know that we were doing that, that that we didn't know that we were part of the whole sort of reconciliation peace process or whatever people like to call it these days yeah. um but we were in fact bringing people together weren't we oh uh, absolutely um i haven't been to ireland for a while with, with covid, COVID etc but i know when, whenever i go back and i've done charity gigs or just meet people in the street uh, they come back and say, oh, we remember such and such a gig. That's where I met my wife, uh, etc." And it was a tremendous uh, social scene. And I'm amazed. I, I think it's very much a part of Irish culture. But after all these years, and, and I'm pleased, it's preserved so much. And I'm just delighted to have been a very, very small part of that. Um, I loved what uh, Father Brian Darcy said recently on one of our programs. He said, the show bands uh, are the one thing that uh, both communities, uh, nationalist and unionist communities, are happy to uh, have as part of their heritage. Yes, I agree with that totally. Yes, very much so. And you did get together a few years ago uh, with Henry. You played, you did a gig or some event, didn't you? Yeah. Yes, we did, um, because we just lost contact. Uh, and then uh, the power of the internet, I managed to locate him. And we used to then have chats regularly. And he said, uh, I'm doing a couple of gig gigs, one in Enniskill, one in Coleraine. Uh, you know, would you like to be a guest artist? I said, well, I haven't sung in about 30 years <laughs> since I left the band. Well, he said, you know, come down three or four days earlier, we'll, we'll do some rehearsals. And I said, well, tell me honestly, if you, if you think I'm not up to it, you know, I'll, I'll just come over for a break. But, but it worked out well. And then that gave me the spur to continue. And I think a few years later, I did a guest spot on the, you probably know it well, the, the Do You Come Here Often show with, with David Howell. Mm -hmm. So that was a good fun. I think I did a 12-day uh, tour with them. Was that like old old times? Because I mean, the type of audience that goes to those shows is uh, that there would be very very uh, big big show band fans and followers. Oh, they they were really good show band fans, uh, and also part of the fun was at the end of the night. You know, we, we'd all congregate uh, in the foyer, and people were just reminiscing, and that was uh, that was really really nice. Yeah. Of course, it was difficult if someone said, do you remember me from 40 years ago? <laughs> well, they looked totally different. But... So did you just stop after that? Did you never play with that? Did you never go on stage again uh, after you quit the, the gents? No, I, I really, I think um, following my new career took so much time, uh, you know, between working, studying in the evening. I just didn't. Um, I think occasionally, I remember once, um, I think it was a works do, and someone knew I sang. 
So they asked me to do a guest spot with, with, with the resident band, and they did a few numbers. But it, it was only after the Henry uh, concerts that gave me the spur, and by now I had more spare time uh, that I was able to do that. You also interact with an awful lot of your old contemporaries, don't you, on Facebook? And uh, I see that there's a lot of chat going on between you. Yes, uh, Facebook is very good. Through Facebook, I've got, in fact, the majority of my Facebook friends live in Ireland. So I think it's the connection with the show band era. And it's through Facebook. I've done a couple of uh, guest spots on the Janie Kirk show in in, in Scotland. Uh, And again, uh, in my very last post, uh, working at a college in Hertfordshire, uh, I got involved with cancer research and uh, decided to do a C- CD. And uh, I did a couple of CDs for cancer research. And I did one, I'm involved uh, with a group in Enniskillen called Women Making Waves. I'm the patron, so I did a couple of charity gigs for them. But unfortunately, due to COVID, everything came to a halt the last three years. Well, perhaps you'll res- resume what you're doing. But I have to say, Jane, that uh, it is... Uh, an absolute thrill for me to, because just talking to you now brings me back to you know, 1964 when I was 13 years old and um, looking at you guys on stage in the Ormond Hall in Carrick and Shore and just thinking to myself, I'd love to do that, you know, and, and it's because of people like you and Henry and Barry and all of those guys that, you know, the encouragement that, that we uh, played our instruments and that, uh, people like Gabe Brazel, who's just a, and Dave Prim, God rest them, world class players, um, were inspired by by yourselves. So uh, I'm delighted that you came on here today, and I hope you get back singing a bit more, and that we'll see more of you, and perhaps even we'll all end up sometime at some gig, someplace, uh, um, and uh, and get on stage together and have the big finale. That that would be great. That would be really fun. Yeah. I look forward to that.